So everybody's heard of kind of dangerous training methods or people will have been told to stay away from certain training protocols or stay away from certain uh, training cycles because they might be too dangerous or they won't be able to do them effectively in their current situation. Today we're going to take a look at three of the most dangerous training methods and why they mightn't work for you. So this video basically isn't looking at like dangerous things per se or you're going to break your leg if you run this training cycle. What we're looking at is like aggressive means of seeking physiological adaptation and a lot of the times we're going to look at why this mightn't be the correct protocol for you to follow or why you might be different from some of the athletes who've run them in the past. So the first thing here is, right, we're not ragging on any training programs. We're not kind of pushing people in one direction or another. We don't care what training programs you want to run. This is just an objective view of why people might get injured or why certain training protocols might be as effective in your particular uh, case. We're not saying any of the methods here don't work, right? A lot of these methods work really, really effectively. A lot of you will have heard of people running these programs you'll know people who've run the programs the thing is a lot of the time these uh, protocols and progressions are designed for people in a very different situation from you so they're designed for full-time athletes they're designed for athletes who would have had a huge uh, on-ramping phase so if they're a professional athlete in the 70s in russia they've probably been in the system since maybe five years of age they have built a huge basis in the sport and they're able to go at these programs with a level of intensity that a an adult onset athlete simply wouldn't be able to achieve. There's other changes here as well, right? So there's the difference between full-time coaching and remote coaching or the difference between living in a training center and you just going to the gym for an hour every two days. The background behind an athlete and the support structure that's there allows them to achieve certain levels of volume and certain levels of intensity that a an amateur athlete couldn't even imagine uh, or couldn't even dream of achieving. Then as we go through each of the sections here, we're going to offer alternatives or we're going to offer ways in which you might be able to kind of alter loading patterns so you can run these programs. It's important to note as well that like this program comes around because these methods are really popular people are interested in these methods almost everybody has heard of the programs we're going to talk about so we just thought it'd be a good idea to give you an idea um, of the kind of background the first of the methods we're going to talk about today is depth jumps uh, or drop jumps this method is kind of made famous by the russian sports scientists of like the late 1900s yuri vershansky uh, i'm sorry if i've butchered that name is a leading name in this kind of area right so a drop jump for those of you who don't know is basically going up onto a height and dropping off and you dropping down and being able to control yourself so it'd be like me hopping up in this chair stepping off the chair and then landing on the balls of my feet the genesis of this and where this kind of started coming up in the literature is when the Russian sports scientists were doing studies on how to build strength, how to build speed, how to build power output, obviously they started seeing that eccentric loading phases and amortization phases are the key areas. Like concentric training doesn't really bring a huge amount in in terms of building muscle, building strength um, and making athletes better. But those eccentrics and the amortization phases are so important. So they then start looking at, okay, how are we going to really, really load an eccentric phase quickly for an athlete? And a great way of loading an eccentric phase is bring an athlete up on a roof and ask them to step off that roof. And then in them dropping down onto the floor and stopping their weight from pummeling through their legs, they have to produce huge amounts of force. The initial studies where they looked at this, they basically took athletes, they started them off probably at like 50 centimeters or a meter, and then they continually increase the height that they were dropping them off and this is where the kind of danger lies here so one of the reasons we pick depth jumps as the most dangerous method is, is it's easily the most misused plyometrics in general are easily the most misused and uh too often used too early and then misapplies pieces of training for athletes okay so we see people using plyometrics in ridiculous forms and then they'll go from having zero physical literacy to going straight to depth jumps and stuff so as you can see the height of the depth jumps that the Russians used were so 
so far beyond what any athlete can feasibly use unless you're incredibly genetically talented very well trained and very strong it's not even funny so if i read you a quote from Ori roman's book uh, the training of the weightlifter right so he he did a lot of his research with Vershansky. So these were Soviet scientists, absolute experts in their field, light years ahead of the research at the time and, you know, true sports scientists. But a quote from him is, it is advisable to include depth jumps in the first three weeks, three times in each of the competition period. The first three workouts consisted of two sets of 10 from 0.5 meters, so half a meter. The third workout was three by 10 from half a meter. The fourth workout was four by 10 from half a meter. And then the following four, uh, five workouts, or 4 by 10 from 0.7 meters. So if we go to, for example, uh, Yuri Vashansky's book, it's uh, the special application of training for sports. He talks about the maximum force diminishes at 1.5 meters of depth jump. So can you imagine the absolute, f like the pain and the force is going through your lower limbs when you're doing a depth jump from 1.5 meters. So they're recommending uh, a little bit more than what people would normally do or what's recommended by most of the sports science is the application of lower sets and lower reps so they're doing sets of 10 so imagine doing 4 by 10 from not even 1.5 meters so that was the maximum they found was effective so they were talking about 0.5 meters which is insane so i'll give you a personal anecdote and i mean i know people might find this kind of they'll rag at me for this but i did some depth jumps as part of my plyometric training last year and i was doing them from approximately 20 centimeters so a 20 kilo thick bumper plate and i was not able to do them correctly for the first three months so i've been in sports for basically 20 of my 27 years of like more than that right and i've been weightlifting for nine and a half years and i couldn't do them properly so when you talk about people doing jet jumps from benches from stacking up plyometric boxes there's oceans of these the the problem with this is it's incredibly injury prone uh, it's malproductive so you don't get the adaptions and then you end up injuring yourself doing ridiculous levels of depth jumps from these so if we were to go to um Vershansky's website so he has a kind of a, an infographic on the progression of where depth jumps end up right so they start with the extensive methods basically this is just jumping it's doing squat jumps unweighted squat jumps standing on the ground and then long jumps so very very basic stuff that some people do in their kids but most people can't do then he moves on to bound jumps with and without or without weights. So this is called the intensive method. So this is just a little bit more intense, a little bit faster. Then they move on to strength training. So barbell exercises, 10 to 5 RMs, maximal effort methods, right? After that, then we've consecutive barbell jumps. So this is all before you can ever progress to barbell jumps. Before that, we have uh, barbell jumps. Then we have kettlebell squat jumps onto a very low uh, kind of bench or boxes. So approximately a couple, like 10, 20 centimeters off the ground. Then we've counter movement barbell jumps and then finally after all that on the fourth level they call it they have depth jumps so how many people do you know that are doing depth jumps who don't have a basis of strength who don't do any of the lower weight stuff and just go straight for depth jumps it's it's really one of the kind of uh it really flies under the radar of one of the one of the dumber things you can do in training and people we see a lot of you know athletics coaches prescribing people general population on instagram because it looks flashy and cool doing different forms of depth jumps absolutely i think the the current prescription of depth jumps if you were to look at like current markers or current standards within the industry the UKSCA is a good area to go and look at current prerequisite before you do level one plyometrics and level one plyometrics is like the most basic so like before you go Basically, you have jumping and landing, which is like what five-year-olds do. Before you go into actual plyometric training, the UKSCA will want you to have a double bodyweight back squat. And when you see people in their mid-40s who are going into a, a strength and conditioning facility and they're being told to do like drop jumps, even if the drop jumps are off tiny boxes or they're doing like rebounding bunny hops over, uh, over those small little hurdles... They, that is so far beyond what you need to be doing. It's ridiculous. Like just the the loading that goes into tendon structures, the loading that goes into like very, very sensitive areas of your body from drop jumps and rebounding plyometrics. Um, the vast majority of people just aren't ready for it. The second method we've chosen as uh, some of the most commonly dumb and dangerous things we see people doing is any variety of stupid squat programs we see people doing right so uh we've stuff like um squat every day or five by five every day or small off or small off junior the russian squat program you know see so people doing going from 
barely following a consistent program for once twice a week squatting probably like 1.2 to 1.3 times their body weight or something then going straight into these incredibly intensive programs so you know the the basis of like the Russian squat program is even in doubt in the origins of it. No one really knows where it came from. Uh, the people who actually, or the rumors of where it came from originally was um, the people who trained in that weightlifting club don't have never heard of it or didn't knew that coach who supposedly wrote it, but didn't actually, there's no record of him ever using that squat program. Then we had things like Smallnoff Jr., which were most of them are written for people to use drugs. And then we get to a stage where you're using drugs, kind of what you do when you're squatting doesn't even matter that much. Yeah, and when you look at this being a dangerous training method or how we could even kind of consider squats to be dangerous, most of it lies within like overloading of squats. So the example of squatting every day and people are saying, oh, if you want to, if I put you on a desert island and you had to get off by squatting 400 pounds, you'd obviously try and squat every day. That doesn't mean it's a intelligent training programmer it doesn't mean it's it's the best way of doing it just because some uneducated person would suddenly think that that's the most intuitive way to get stronger uh the way most of the people get injured when we see them doing these kind of misinformed squat programs are they will get knee pain uh presenting in in the, a form similar to knee tendonitis or knee tendinopathy they will also get things like lower back pain they'll usually have some sort of breakdown in squat form just because the loading is so high so when you look at the knee pain we're talking about most of it revolves around the tendon uh so like tendonitis or tendinopathy whatever degree of tendon inflammation is there why do the tendons get so inflamed? Well, it's it's a very simple thing. Like Owen said earlier, most of the time people are going from not following intensive squat programs or not even paying attention to how much squatting they're doing. And then they go into this like super, super heavy weight, uh, really high volume program and they struggle to adapt. The other part of these programs is there's no like on ramping or there's no prerequisites you have to hit most of the time people will download the pdf or download the program and they'll just jump head first in and usually you will make major increases you'll usually get a, a fairly serious bump in one rm but after the program you're so worn out you're so kind of dejected with the whole movement that you'll just stop squatting and you could lose that 20 percent you gained in your one rm you could lose 25 percent because you'll just stop wanting to squat so the problem with these incredibly high frequency squat programs is that it's actually skewed the culture of the kind of strength training sphere a bit or the, especially the amateur strength training sphere but how much you actually need to squat to get better so these like hyper intensive uh hyper frequency high weight high volume squat programs really change people's perception on how much you actually need to squat f effectively and safely okay so, so it skews people's perception on what an effective program looks like for progressing your squat or intelligent volume so people assume because all of these work right so the whole point of training if you boil it down to base parts especially strength training is that you want to do as much volume as you can possibly recover from to progress so the more volume you can do the more in theory the more load you put on your system the more load you can put on your fucking being the more you will be able to progress if you can recover from it so to a certain point these work very well because these are just absolute fucking geezer or geysers of fucking um volume on your system so you go from absolutely hardly any volume to massive amounts of it so your body in some cases, response is stimulus, and then, you know, you respond with some kind of super conversation and you end up with a very high squat, but almost certainly you end up being injured, okay? So, what people don't understand is that the prevalence of these squat programs end up just massively skewing what people real don't realize is that you can squat way less. So, if you look at, for example, who needs to squat with this intensity and this frequency, and to be honest, the answer is basically no one, okay? So, there's a very niche athlete who needs to squat every day and they don't even have to squat every day but there is a certain style of athlete and it's an elite weightlifter who is trying to maintain a certain level of performance at certain periods throughout the year so some elite weightlifters need to squat every day to maintain a certain kind of cns prime so a certain kind of physiological state of readiness to lift weights with a high rate of force development but even for these weightlifters that level of high frequency squatting is not the best way for them to get a bigger squat. So a lot of these are on performance enhancing drugs. That's just a kind of a statement of fact. We know that it's not a morality issue. It's just as, as it is. But were they to squat less and with different forms of aggressive overload, they would end up with a bigger squat. And they know this too, but that's not why they're squatting. So they're not squatting to have the biggest squat. They're squatting to stay ready and stay in shape for weightlifting.
the last of the three kind of dangerous training methods or most dangerous ways of training we're going to talk about today is the Bulgarian method. So the Bulgarian method is a kind of phrase that was put on it post hoc. It's basically Ivan Avajev, uh, how he used to coach the Bulgarian national team uh, in the late 60s all the way through. This is one of the most successful periods of weightlifting for a national team in history. So basically more Bulgarians were winning more gold medals than every other country put together. What this method consisted of was getting athletes to max their snatch, clean and jerk and squat every day for multiple sessions within the day. So there's a few different accounts of how many times the maxes would happen. There's a few different accounts of what an actual max looked like. But in essence, they were going anywhere from four sessions a day to 10 sessions a day where they would hit a one rep max on snatch then a one rep max on clean and jerk, then a one rep max on a front squat or a back squat. This is the famous thing we see in that uh, documentary on YouTube, School of Champions, where you have basically a training hall full of world champion weightlifters. They're still some of the best lifters to have ever lived. They're all training together and they go in, they might start with 70 or 120 kilos on the bar, they will snatch close to a world record, they'll take five minutes, they usually have a cigarette, then they will go and clean and jerk somewhere close to a world record, then they'll take five minutes and then they'll do a squat. They'll usually take around 25 to 45 minutes off in between sessions, this might be enough to eat some food, they'll go back into the gym then, usually with the barbell still loaded in some way on the platform, and they'll go for another max after another max after another max. This is as close to sports specificity, or it's the definition of sports specificity, if we took the squatting out of it. They're basically doing a maximal attempt at their event, then they take a tiny break and they repeat that over and over and over again. Why is this dangerous? Well, famously, Ivan was known as the Butcher. He was known as the Butcher for two reasons. Apparently, he used to go around to slaughterhouses and get bulls testicles and make the weightlifters eat them to increase their testosterone. But more likely, the fact he was known as the Butcher is because he broke a lot of athletes. So they would take in a huge cohort of 12, 13-year-old athletes. They would start training them as hard as possible and then after a stage they'd start juicing them as hard as possible and obviously they might come out with one athlete from every year who is extremely successful or maybe two or three world champions from each of those batches of a thousand kids a good idea of just how enriched that culture was with with drugs when you look at the the book the white prisoner uh they talk about a training program that's designed around the increase in intensity of drug taking and the increase in volume of drug taking so every day they would go to training that cup of pills will get bigger and bigger and bigger the amount of shots they would take will be greater throughout the week so it's not that their training altered it's not that the volume of training they did altered it was literally the the protocols and the amount they were taking changed and that was what would alter the weight on the bar the training program in essence didn't change they just continually threw intensity at athletes and then they figured out which of those athletes didn't break so i think that touches on the most important point about bulgarian weightlifting the school of bulgarian weightlifting that system and it's the most misrepresented and it's the most forgotten the sole purpose of the bulgarian weightlifting system was not to create the most effective most intelligent most intuitive weightlifting system it was to win gold medals set world records for the country of bulgaria that was its sole purpose it wasn't what's the best system we can make what are the most grounded in scientific principles what kind of system can we make that anyone can run this and develop a champion we are what is the most effective way that we can make world champions world record holders and olympic gold medalists that was the sole purpose of this program nothing else mattered it didn't matter if uh, an athlete lost it didn't matter if an athlete got injured all that mattered is olympic gold medals that is the fundamental thing that people forget. So when people try and apply the Bulgarian phys the philosophy to their training, they're forgetting that it's not for them. It's it's so far from them that it's it's not even related. They're not even the same sport at, at some stage when you look at the elite Bulgarians and what beginner weightlifters should be doing. So there's kind of there's two reasons why the Bulgarian method is one of the most dangerous, okay? So 
Number one, like Fitz mentioned, is the sheer load of training at maximal intensities is incredibly dangerous and very injury prone and very often can leave lifters injured in a very, very short period of time combined with maximal strength events very, very frequently. So you have very dynamic movements at high weights very frequently and then very high force, heavy, intense squats very, very frequently, as heavy as possible with minimal warm up, no assistance, no corrective exercises. But part two is the one of the most reasons that people kind of forget that it won't work for them but also in kind of in a roundabout way makes it one of the most dangerous training methods is the sheer level of drugs and the quality quantity and just diversity of drugs that uh, Ivan Abijayev was known to give his athletes and then there's some incredible rumors of uh, his athletes trying you know uh, PCP uh, different kinds of amphetamines tree training you know they refuse to take those sometimes you know so the the level of drugs how often they took them were rumored to be an enormous amount so that in itself is one of the reasons it makes it so dangerous and it's it's a lie to say that drugs are not intrinsically linked with the bulgarian method ivan abajev was confused as why you would do weightlifting without drugs it, to him weightlifting and drugs went hand in hand they were combined at the soul we understand why people want to do the bulgarian method right people like doing weightlifting because they like lifting weights they like doing snatches they like doing clean and jerks most of us like squatting and we like doing it with heavy weights so if we had our choice you just want to do like one rep max snatches and one rep max clean and jerks that's probably why you got into the sport unfortunately it just doesn't make you better even if you were in the situation whereby you could go and take all the drugs you wanted Things are just very, very different now, and there's not going to be 500 of you lined up so that once you break, your replacement will take over, then their replacement will take over, then their replacement will take over. So even if you're in the situation where you don't want to compete, you have access to all these compounds, the method still won't work that effectively for you unless you are that one in a thousand or one in 10,000 people who have that genetic potential to achieve that loading in their training most people are just going to break so then the question is is there anything else the bulgarians did that allowed them to achieve these numbers of intensity right so what was their onboarding like their on-ramping for an athlete started as i said earlier when they were very very young they might have been 10 or 12 years of age they would have already been training in a weightlifting setup they would have already known the movements so their on-ramping started at a much earlier age than that then at the age of 10 or 12 they'd be brought into a a regional squad or a regional sectional uh, team then within that that regional team they'd be given a training program for 12 months they would go back home complete that training program for 12 months uh, this is without drugs then at the end of those 12 months those 500 kids would be brought back in for testing they probably picked around 50 athletes from those 500 those 50 athletes would then be taken for 12 months and they would be given certain protocols they'd be pushed incredibly hard for 12 months and then you get a 14 year old who's already had two years of full-time weightlifting or maybe three years of full-time weightlifting if they didn't make it the first time they also have 12 months of enhanced weightlifting and then they go into a bulgarian training method where at 14 15 16 years of age they already have a big history of training behind them and they can start pushing these kind of weights so we hope you like this video uh hopefully it gave you some kind of background we're going to go into some of the specifics in this and and if you have if there's things that popped up in this video that are interesting to you comment below with if you want us to do a video on the small of squat cycle or anything like that we'll do our very best to put out some more information on it as always if you want more videos click on that button below we have loads of videos similar to this and some more in-depth looks at the science behind sport if you want coaching or consultancy go to seekestrength.com and if you want more long-term conversations or long-form conversations check out our podcast it's on itunes spotify all the usual places you listen to people talk thanks <laughs>